Hello and welcome everyone to the 8th episode of our weekly podcast India Colonized. I'm your host Umar Haq. I hope you're doing well during these testing times. And while we are trying to bring you new episodes every week, this week we are going to be talking about the infamous gem, the Kohenur. We will talk a little bit about it. Its history and we will try to get into terms with the understanding of colonial loot and who has the rightful claim to the loot people who have took it or the people who it originally belonged to and who did it originally belong to taking the case of kohenor and tracking its ownership and how it is quite much more complex a problem than rest of the art that was taken as a result of wars and other conflicts so we bring to you the 8th episode of india colonized kohenor The history of Kohenur. The diamond came from India's alluvial mines thousands of years ago. It was sifted from the sands, and according to Hindu belief, it was revered by gods like Krishna, even though it seemed to carry a curse if the luck of its owner was anything to go by. The gem, which would come to be known as the Kohenur diamond, wove its way through Indian court intrigues before eventually ending up in the British crown jewels by mid 1800s. That was when a British amateur geologist interviewed gemologists and historians on the diamond's origins and wrote the history of Kohenur that served as the basis for the most future stories of the diamond. But according to historians Anita Anand and William Dalimple, the geologist got it all wrong we found what every historian longs for says dalimpel a story which is incredibly important to people an object known around the world but which is still built on the structure of a myth in their new book kohenur the history of the world's most infamous diamond Anand and Dalimpal work their way through more than 4 centuries of Indian history to learn the truth about the diamond panning the old research like the Indians who sieved the river sand for the diamond says Anand and the true history has its fair share of drama for Dalimpal it is a perfectly scripted game of thrones script style all the romance all the blood all the gore and all the bling But beneath the drama of the diamond is a more serious question that still has no clear answer. How should modern nations deal with colonial legacy of looting? With numerous countries including India, Pakistan and the Taliban in Afghanistan having claimed ownership of the Kohenur, it is a topic of vigorous debate. To understand where the diamond comes from and whether it could ever go back requires to div- diving into the murky past when india was ruled by the outsiders the moguls for centuries india was the world's only source of diamonds all the way up until 1725 with the discovery of diamond mines in brazil most of the gemstones were alluvial meaning they could be sifted out of river sands and the rulers of the subcontinent embraced their role as the first diamond connoisseurs In many ancient Indian courts jewelry rather than clothing was a principal form of adornment and a visible sign of court hierarchy with strict rules being laid down to establish which rank of courtier could wear which gem in the sitting The world oldest texts on gemology also comes from India and they include quite sophisticated classification system for different kind of stones The Turko Mongol leader Zahiruddin Babur came from Central Asia through the Khyber Pass located between modern day Afghanistan and Pakistan and he came here to invade India in 1526 establishing the Islamic Mughal dynasty and the new era of infatuation with gemstones the Mughal rule would rule the entire north India for 330 years expanding their territory across nearly present day India Pakistan, Bangladesh, eastern Afghanistan and while reveling in the mountains of gemstones they inherited and pillaged. Although it is impossible to know exactly where the Kohenur came from and where it first came into the Mughals possession, there is a definite point at which it appears in the written records. 
In 1628, the Mughal ruler Shah Jahan commissioned a magnificent gemstone encrusted throne. The bejeweled structure was inspired by the fabled throne of Solomon, the Hebrew king who figures into the history of Islam, Judaism and Christianity. Shah Jahan's throne took seven years to make, costing four times as much as the Taj Mahal, which was also under construction. One of the court chroniclers of the time, Ahmad Shah Lahori, writes about the throne in his account, and I quote, The outside of the canopy was to be enamel work studded with gems. The inside was to be thickly set with rubies, carnets, and other jewels. And it was to be supported by emerald columns. On top of each pillar, there were two peacocks thick set with gems. And between each of these two peacocks, a tree set with rubies and diamonds, emeralds and pearls. Among the many precious stones that adorned the throne, two were particularly enormous gems that would in time become the most valued of all. The Temur ruby, the most highly valued by the Mughals because they preferred coloured stones, and the Kohenur diamond, the diamond which was lodged at the very top of the throne, in the head of glistening gemstone peacock. For a century after the creation of the peacock throne, the Mughal Empire retained its supremacy in India and beyond. It was the wealthiest state in Asia. Delhi, the capital city, was home to 2 million people more than London and Paris combined. But that prosperity attracted the attention of other rulers in Central Asia, including Persian ruler Nadir Shah. When Nadir invaded Delhi in 1739, the ensuing carnage cost tens of thousands of lives and depletion of the treasury. Nadir left the city accompanied by so much gold and so many gems that the looted treasure required 700 elephants. It doesn't stop there. 4,000 camels, you think it would have, but no, and 12,000 horses to pull it. Nadir took the peacock throne as a part of his treasure. He removed the Temur ruby and the Kohinoor diamond to wear it on his armband. Because why not? The Kohinoor would remain away from India in a country that would become Afghanistan for 70 years. It passed between the hands of various rulers in one blood-soaked episode after another, including a king who blinded his own son and a deposed ruler whose shaved head was coronated with molten gold. With all the fighting between Central Asia and factions, a power vacuum grew in India. The British came soon to fill it. At the turn of the 19th century, the British East India Company expanded its territorial control from the coastal cities to the interior of the Indian subcontinent. As Dalimpil and Anita Anand write of the British campaigns, and I quote, they would ultimately annex more territory than all of Napoleon's conquests in Europe. Unquote. In addition to claiming more natural resources and trading posts, the British also had their eyes on a piece of priceless treasure, the Kohenur. After decades of fighting, the diamond returned to India and came into the hands of the Sikh ruler Ranjit Singh in 1813, whose particular affection for the gem ultimately sealed its aura of prestige and power. It was not just Ranjit Singh like diamond and respected the stone's vast monetary value. The gem seemed to have held far greater symbolism for him, writes Anand and Dalimpil. He had won back from the Afghani Durrani dynasty amongst all the Indian lands they had seized since the time of Ahmad Shah Abdali. For Anand, Singh's elevation of the diamond was a major turning point in history. The transition is startling when the diamond becomes a symbol of potency rather than beauty. Anand says, and I quote, It becomes like this gemstone, like the ring in the Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all. For the British, that symbol of prestige and power was irresistible. If they could own the jewel of India as well as the country itself, it would symbolize their power and colonial superiority. It was a diamond worth fighting and killing for, now more than ever. 
When the British learned of Ranjit Singh's death in 1839 and his plan to give the diamond to the other jewel, uh, and his plan to give the diamond and other jewels to a sect of Hindu priests, the British press exploded in outrage. The richest and the most costly gem in the known world has been committed to a trust of a profane, idolatrous and mercenary priesthood, writes one anonymous editorial. Its author urged the British East India Company to do whatever they could to keep track of the Kohenur so that it might be ultimately theirs. But the colonists were first forced to wait out the chaotic period of changing rulers. After Ranjit Singh's death in 1839, the Punjabi throne passed between four different rulers over four years. At the end of the violent period, the only people left in line for throne was a young boy, Tulip Singh, and his mother, Rani Jind. And in 1849, after imprisoning Jindin, the British forced Tulip Singh to sign a legal document amending the Treaty of Lahore that required Tulip to give away the Kohinoor and all claim to sovereignty. The boy was merely 10 years old. From there, the diamond became a special possession of Queen Victoria. It was displayed at 1851's Great Exposition in London, only for the British people to be dismayed at how simple it was. Many people find it difficult in bringing themselves to believe from its external appearance that it is anything but a piece of common glass, writes the time in June 1851. Given its disappointing reception, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, had the stone cut and polished, a process that reduced the size by half but made the light refract more brilliantly from its surface. While Victoria wore the diamond as a brooch, it eventually became part of the crown jewels, first in the crown of Queen Alexandra, the wife of Edward VII, Victoria's oldest son, and then in the crown of Queen Mary, the wife of George V, grandson of Victoria. The diamond came to its current place of honour, 1937, at the front of the crown wore by Queen Mother, wife of George IV and mother of Elizabeth II. The crown made its last public appearance in 2002, resting atop of the coffin of Queen Mother for her funeral. Still shrouded in myth and mystery, including a rumour that the diamond is cursed, one thing is clear when it comes to Kohenur. It sparks plenty of controversy. If you ask anybody what should happen to the Jewish art stolen by the Nazis, everyone would say, of course, they've got to be given back to their owners. And yet, we've come to say not say the same thing about the Indian loot taken hundred of years earlier, also at the point of Kant. What is the moral distinction between the stuff taken by force during the colonial times? For Anand, the issue was even more personal. Born and raised in the UK, her family is Indian and her relatives regularly visited. When they would tour the Tower of London and see the Kohenur and the Crown Jewels, Anand remembers them spending copious amounts of time swearing themselves blue at the glass case of the diamond in it. According to Richard Kurin, Smithsonian's first distinguished scholar and ambassador at large, as well as the author of Hope Diamond, the legendary history of a cursed gem, part of the reason these gemstones came to be perceived as cursed is because of how they were gained. When the powerful take things from the less powerful, the powerless have nothing much to do except curse the powerful, Kurin says. And like the Kohinoor, the Hope Diamond came from India and was displayed at London Exposition 1851. It is now displayed in the National Museum of Natural History, having been donated by Harry Winston, who legally purchased the diamond. While well, Kurian says uncovering the line of ownership of the gemstone like Kohinoor is best practice when it comes to history, it does not necessarily lead to legal obligation. He and Dalimple both point out that the rulers who once owned these gemstones headed nations that no longer exist. This is one of the biggest differences between objects taken during colonial conquest and art and treasure looted by the Nazis. The difficulty in ascertaining who has the right and the most legitimate claim to anything. 
Post colonial collection is a very big topic everywhere, says Chen Melosh, the director of Smithsonian Provenance Research Initiative. There can be a resentment for certain objects of we may have legal ownership, but does it make sense to keep them keep this material with them? She cites a 2014 case in which the British Museum returned two bronze statues from Benin to Nigeria. They were taken during an attack in 1897 after British officers were killed during trade missions. But returning pillaged art and treasure from World War II, as complicated as that can be, is still far less complex than unraveling colonial history. You're dealing with countries that existed when the object was acquired, but they do not exist anymore. And the countries who had the trade agreements with that may have different export laws now. Provenance is very complex and people aren't used to processing a chain of ownership. By the time you hit the second or the third owner over time, the information can get more difficult to research. This is why I say it is important that these things not to be yanked out of museum because at least people have the access and can study them until we know for sure if they were looted. The Kohenur isn't the only contested treasure currently residing in the UK. Perhaps equally controversial are the Elin marble statues carved 2,500 years ago and taken from the Parthenon in Athens. So far, the UK has retained the ownership of the statues and diamonds regardless of calls for their return. Anand thinks one solution that doesn't require removing Kohinoor from the UK is to make the history of the diamond clearer. What I would dearly love is for there to be a really clear sign by the exhibit. People are thought that this was a gift from India to Britain. I would like to correct history to be put by the diamond, says Anand. Dalimpil agrees that disseminating the true history is half the battle. Whenever we lecture, we find people who are horrified by the diamond and its history, but they are not resistant. They are just unaware of it, says Dalimpil. The diamond isn't likely to leave the crown jewels anytime soon. Anand and Dalimpil only hope that their work will do some good by clarifying the true path of the infamous gemstone followed and helping leaders to come to their own conclusions about what to do with it next. That's it for today's episode. Thank you everyone for tuning in for today's podcast episode, The Kohe Noor. If you liked it, please share it. And if you like our channel and want to listen to more, please go to our channel and find more videos on the YouTube channel. And if you're listening to the podcast on any of the audio channels, please consider following and subscribing to us. If you loved it, please do share it with your friends and spread the word. It really helps us a lot and motivates us a lot to come up with new episodes and new content. Meanwhile, have a good day, stay safe, stay home and take care.